Powell was born on January 31, 1980, in Maryland to Judy Powell. She was described as ambitious and hardworking with a big smile. After graduating Largo High School in 1998, she joined the U.S. Army and ended up serving in Korea for four years. Once she returned to Maryland, she began working for the government as a security worker at the prestigious John Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. Her job required top-level security clearance and a lot of secret traveling as she was in charge of hundreds of projects. It reportedly involved NASA and the military, but she couldn't even tell her mother what she did exactly or where she had traveled to. At the age of 28, she lived alone in an apartment in Laurel, Maryland. On August 22, 2008, she heard a knock at her door, and so she peeked through the hole and saw a man holding up a fake badge claiming he was an FBI agent. Kanika was smart and wouldn't open the door without seeing a picture ID, and so the mystery man left. She called 911 and the police came to her apartment, but no one was found. The incident jarred her so much that she wrote this email to share with her friends and family. I just wanted to share with you the scariest thing that happened to me this weekend. Saturday evening around 7 p.m., a man was knocking at my door, as you all may know I live alone. I asked who it was and he didn't answer, so once I got close to the door and looked out of the peephole, I saw a male figure that was not familiar to me at all. I asked who he was and all he stated was that he was from the FBI and that he was looking for Kanika Powell. It freaked me out completely because this man knew my name. He held a shield up but no picture ID and he never gave his name. He told me he was looking for me in regards to an investigation. I told him that I had no idea as to what he was talking about and that he would need to show me documentation as well as a warrant of some sort. So he left and I looked out my bedroom window and saw him walking. I also heard a voice tell him to walk in the opposite direction. The whole situation was scary and seemed so false. So because of this incident, not only did I get no sleep for the rest of the weekend, but I am now trying to get an alarm system installed in my apartment. I had one in my old apartment, but I just hadn't had it transferred over to my new one. As far as everything that happened with the guy, I did call the FBI and they told me that it was more than likely bogus because they never come to your door by themselves and they always leave a card of some sort so that you can contact them. I called the local police as well to give them a description just in case someone is out there trying to rape or harm single women. Pass this on, ladies. This is not a fake forward. This happened to me, Kanika. Who knows who these guys are and what they are doing and in what areas other than mine? Five days later, in the evening hours of August 27, 2008, Kanika had another knock at her door. This time, it was a man claiming to have a package for Kanika Powell, but was not holding a package. Again, Kanika wouldn't open the door, and a package was never left. The very next morning, about 7 a.m., another knock was at the door, and someone once again claiming to have a package for Kanika, but she again would not answer. She called the police, and an officer came out to speak with her, but again, nothing was found. She confided in her mother what was going on, but never offered an explanation of why she thought the men were continuing to knock on her door. After the police left, Kanika decided to not go to work that day and instead leave to run errands during daylight so she wouldn't have to be out at dark during this time. When she came back, someone was waiting for her in the hallway outside her apartment. The suspect shot Kanika multiple times on the first landing of her apartment. She was transported to the hospital but sadly died the next day. According to detectives, she had no boyfriend, no known enemies, and they don't believe her job was a motive. Her wallet and keys were next to her body, which showed the incident was not a robbery. Three months later, 31-year-old Sean Green, an IT professional for a national security contractor, was shot nine times while sitting at a red light just 25 miles from Kanika's apartment. Many have speculated that Sean and Kanika's murders were connected and they were possibly silenced for something they knew. Obviously, someone was determined to have her assassinated and it is speculated by many that it did involve her work and as of June 2022, this case remains unsolved.
Allison Goodwin Thresher was born and raised in Wichita, Kansas. At the age of 45, she was living in the Sumner Highlands Apartments in the 4500 block of Sangamore Road in Bethesda, Maryland with her 12-year-old daughter Hannah and 10-year-old son Sam. She shared custody of the children with her ex-husband James and the pair had been in a custody dispute since their separation in 1997. Meanwhile, both her children attended the Friends Community School where Hannah was being taught Spanish by 32-year-old Fernando Asturizaga. Asturizaga was also a soccer coach, after-school care provider, and summer camp employee at the school. He babysat the children for both Allison and James initially, but when Allison became suspicious of his intentions with her daughter, she no longer would allow him to babysit while they were in her care. She believed he had been having an inappropriate relationship with Hannah since she was just 10 years old and in the fourth grade. In June 1999, Allison wrote him a letter telling him to stop spending time alone with Hannah, saying, Several times over the last several months, I have expressed my concern to you that my daughter, Hannah, has formed an excessive emotional bond with you. When I made it clear that I did not want the two of you to be alone together, you assured me that you would, in fact, no longer babysit for Hannah and Sam. That was not true, and this led me to wonder whether this unnatural attachment is a mutual one. Against Allison's wishes, Asturizaga continued to look after the children when they were in the care of their father, James. Allison and James were fighting over guardianship of the children, and Asturizaga's contact with Hannah was a factor in the custody battle. Throughout 1999, Allison also notified the school about her suspicions and eventually withdrew her daughter from the school. She also continued to voice her concerns to James and Asturizaga as well. She also notified her attorney that she heard from other parents who were concerned about his relationship with their daughters as well. She requested both Asturizaga and the school that there be no further contact between her daughter and him. Allison also kept a journal detailing her concerns. In February 2000, things had bowled over and Allison and Asturizaga would have an altercation outside of Hannah's father's home about his continued babysitting of Hannah. A couple months later, on May 23, 2000, Allison had dinner with her parents in her hometown of Bethesda and returned home later that night. She spoke to a friend on the phone at about 10 p.m. and emailed her employer at midnight. She was scheduled to begin a new position the next day as a copy editor for the Washington Post website, but she never showed up. After two days of not showing up to work and not calling, they notified her family about her absence. The day after she was last seen, her copper-colored 1997 Volvo station wagon was found abandoned on the corner of Ridge Drive and Broad Street near the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal in the Glen Echo area, which is several miles from her apartment. Turns out, just a few hours after Allison emailed her employer at midnight, her neighbor downstairs was awakened by the sound of a woman's scream followed by sobbing around 4 a.m. The sounds came from Allison's apartment, and the crying was so bad that the neighbor considered calling the police, but she didn't. She also heard a lot of footsteps in Allison's apartment. Her case was initially viewed as a missing person investigation, but it was reclassified as a presumed homicide eight months into the investigation. Authorities stated that evidence related to her disappearance had been recovered and pointed towards foul play. Meanwhile, Asturizaga's relationship with Hannah continued until 2001. He was eventually charged with sexual abuse in 2003, but found not guilty later that year. In 2010, Asturizaga was charged with two counts of second-degree rape, six counts of second-degree sex offense, and two counts of child abuse against Hannah. Two years later, he was found guilty on all counts and sentenced to over 100 years in prison for raping Hannah for three years. Hannah stated that after her mother disappeared, Asturizaga didn't understand why Hannah was upset. He even told her that he thought things would be easier for them now that she was gone. As a child, Hannah didn't think anything of this at the time and for years never suspected his possible involvement. She stated Asturizaga had groomed her and told her not to tell her mother that he was abusing her. 
In April 2018, he was named a person of interest in Allison's disappearance. Investigators believe Allison was murdered at her apartment and that her body was disposed of at an unknown location. They stated the killer had also tried to clean up blood evidence at the scene. A man matching Estrazaga's description was seen running through Allison's neighborhood near where her car was found at about 6 a.m. on May 24th, just a couple hours after her downstairs neighbor heard her sobbing. Police are investigating his possible involvement in the case, but at this time, there is not enough evidence to officially name him as a suspect. While he was in prison for abusing Hannah, he would take his own life after it became public that he was the prime suspect in Allison's disappearance. In the summer of 2020, police put out information that they were searching for Allison's body. They revealed that Leeds suggested she had been buried in the area of the U.S. Department of Agricultural's Beltsville Research Center, but that their search had thus far been unsuccessful, and as of June 2022, this case remains unsolved. Melanie Faith Melanie was born in 1972 and described as outspoken but with a kind heart, a spitfire, and full of love by those that knew her. She married a man named Greg Melanie, and the couple had a daughter in addition to her son from a previous relationship, but the marriage wouldn't last. At the age of 45, she was a mother and grandmother sharing an apartment with her boyfriend, known as Joe, at the Chesapeake Glen Apartments in Glen Burnie, Maryland. On the afternoon of October 11, 2018, she went to a nail salon with her friend Amy. Afterwards, she returned to her apartment and was seen on CCTV walking into the apartment building. Melanie was never seen leaving the apartment building again. However, the cameras didn't capture high-quality images and they couldn't see people coming and going after dark. She and Amy exchanged text messages until bedtime as they usually did. The next morning, Amy sent her a text, and strangely, when a reply came through later, it was just an emoji, which was very unusual as she never used emojis alone. Several of Melanie's friends also tried to reach her throughout the day, but were unsuccessful. Her friends and mother were in daily communication with Melanie, but no one was getting any answers to calls or texts. Two days later, her boyfriend Joe said that she had just left early that morning to go get her nails done. This was strange because she had just gotten them done two days earlier and none of the nail salons were open early in the morning. In addition, her car remained in the parking lot of the apartment complex. Melanie worked at an Amazon facility but failed to show up for work on the next day, which was very out of character for her. That's when her friends became alarmed and decided to report Melanie missing. They searched the wooded area behind the apartment building, but found nothing, and all calls at this point were going straight to her voicemail. Joe began allegedly talking bad about Melanie to police and on social media, painting a picture of her as a peel head and insinuating that maybe she had just up and left, which ultimately delayed the investigation as law enforcement believed she could be on a bender somewhere. Melanie had been in pain management for chronic neck and back pain and managed her medications very well with no concerns. Then on October 3rd, 10 days after she was reported missing, a person walking their dog in the 1400 block of Furnace Avenue found a portion of a human leg in Anne Arundel County at the edge of Marley Creek behind a church. The tattoo on the remains turned out to be the same as Melanie's, but it would take about three months for DNA testing to officially determine it was in fact Melanie's. Searches were done of the creek, but no other remains were located. Surprisingly to her loved ones, authorities determined that the portion of the leg couldn't determine that she had indeed died as a result. Therefore, she remains listed as a missing person and not a homicide victim. This is frustrating to her loved ones because there have been other cases where just a body part was recovered that were changed from missing to murdered. It is reported that Joe grew up in the Marley Creek area and knew it very well. He also previously lived in an apartment above the E&M Machinery, which is located in Curtis Bay. This is where they lived prior to the apartment she went missing from and where one night she attempted to leave him but he wouldn't allow her, which resulted in her falling down the stairs. 
Though investigators questioned her boyfriend Joe, who is believed to be the last person to have seen Melanie alive, they still don't have any suspects or persons of interest in the case. Her family feels that they know who is responsible for Melanie's disappearance and presumed murder. However, there just is not enough evidence at this time. A $13,000 reward is being offered for a credible tip that leads to an arrest and conviction. Someone out there knows something and it is time for them to come forward, but as of June 2022, this case remains unsolved. Robin Leah Pope was born in Abilene, Texas on July 24, 1961. At the age of 51, she lived on Kent Island in Stevensville, Maryland, and was the mother of two, Priscilla and Rachel. Robin was described as a vivacious, fun-loving, kind-hearted, and a brave woman. She was not only a breast cancer survivor, but a loving mother and a friend to many. She knew everyone in her close-knit waterfront community on Chesapeake Bay in Maryland and owned the successful Island Fence Company business. She also worked full-time as a dental assistant. She was very recently separated from her husband of 20 years, Wayne Pope, after he discovered that Robin had been having an alleged affair. After their separation, he became increasingly agitated and angry, according to those that were close to the couple. According to her husband, just weeks after their separation, on March 1, 2013, Robin called him around 10 p.m. to tell him she wanted to come to the house and pick up some of her belongings and a fence post digger for a job site. He claims he soon fell asleep and woke at 11.30 p.m. to find Robin's car parked outside. He said he approached her car to find her asleep and startled her. He said he told her he was leaving because his lawyer advised him not to be alone with her. He said he left and drove to the 7-Eleven in Graysonville, two towns over for a cup of coffee. Afterwards, he drove to his father's house to pick up his truck and then returned home. Upon his return, he said Robin's car was still there and she and their great Dane Bella was nowhere to be seen. After 1 a.m., he showed up to Robin's best friend Debbie's house looking for Robin and acting strange. Debbie immediately had a bad feeling that something had happened to her best friend of 23 years. Robin was quickly reported missing and a search for her began. Later that day, Robin's dog Bella was sadly found dead on the rocks near the pier just a couple houses down and her body was taken to the Humane Society for an autopsy. She was found with bruises on her feet, and it appeared she had been attempting to get out of the water before possibly dying of hypothermia. The vet noted that it was strange she had been in water because Great Danes typically avoid water. Meanwhile, an extensive search continued for Robin by authorities and her many loved ones. Nearly three weeks later, on March 23, 2013, Robin's body was found in the water of the Chesapeake Bay, just half a mile from where she was last seen. Police are calling it a suspicious death, saying they have not ruled out anything or anyone. Police say there were no visible signs of intentional trauma, and a cause of death has not yet been determined. After the autopsy, Robin's body was released to her husband Wayne, and he had her body cremated just a few days later. Her best friend stated that Robin would have never taken Bella outside on a 37-degree night with high wind gust. She also said that Robin would have never gone back to her house alone late at night unless Bella's life was threatened. Police believe there are people out there that haven't told investigators everything they know. On the anniversary each year, some of her loved ones toss roses in the water from the beach in her memory. Robin's friends and family continued to seek truth and justice for her, but as of June 2022, this case remains unsolved. James Arthur Cole was born on September 6, 1972, and went by Jimmy. He was later adopted by Dorothy and Ronald Cole and lived in Severna Park, Maryland with his two brothers in the 500 block of Hodges Lane. He graduated from Severna Park High School, and at the age of 21, Jimmy had been dating a woman named Mary Collison for three years and had a job at the K&J Maintenance Company. 
On the evening of April 10, 1994, Jimmy and his brother Jeff went out for drinks at the now-defunct Shangri-La Restaurant and Cocktail Lounge, located only four blocks from their home in the Park Plaza Shopping Center, located in the 500 block of Ritchie Highway. At 10 p.m., Jeff decided to go home, but Jimmy returned to the Shangri-La where he remained until about 1.30 a.m. According to a waitress named Donna Robbins, Jimmy was alone and had drank enough that by the time he left, he was slurring his words. However, the waitress didn't see whether he began walking home, as he usually did, or if he got into a vehicle with someone. Jimmy's house was only four blocks away, and Jimmy often walked home after spending nights at the bars, as he didn't own a car. After he left the Shangri-La, no one ever saw him again. After not coming home, his family began to search the neighborhood, looking along possible routes that he may have taken. Based on his habit of taking shortcuts, it's likely that Jimmy took the Baltimore and Annapolis Trail at least part of the way. According to his family, Jimmy had no known enemies and had no history of disappearing. There are no bodies of water between the Shangri-La and Jimmy's house, but there is a small creek called Cattail Creek that the trail crossed over if he would have continued northwest on it. Some speculate that Jimmy may not have been ready for the night to end, and being experienced in the nearby woods, decided to instead of turning on Stewart Way to head to his home on Hodges Lane, he could have kept walking along the trail, eventually crossing Robinson Road leading to the small creek. He could have gotten lost or didn't feel like he could make it home and decided to lie down. He was known to camp or sleep in the woods at times, but at 1.30 in the morning, the woods would have been very dark. The temperature that night was about 44 degrees Fahrenheit. That, combined with intoxication, leads to a theory of death from exposure. However, it is possible that Jimmy could have met with foul play. There is no mention of search dogs until 2012, 18 years after Jimmy went missing and when the area was more developed. Cyclists and walkers on the Baltimore and Annapolis Trail were joined by nine volunteer search and rescue teams walking along different sections of the trail north and south from Robinson Crossing. Some items were collected during the search, but it was unknown whether they were related to human or animal remains. They were taken to the medical examiner for evaluation and testing. It's been 28 years since Jimmy went missing, and his family has never stopped searching for answers, but as of June 2022, this case remains unsolved. <laughs>